you're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled The Digitalization of Energy, a European View. How do European think tanks view the digitalization of energy? I participated in a workshop organized by one such organization recently on the likely impacts and timing of digital on the energy sector, and here's the results of the conversation. By way of background, the International Energy Energy Agency, who organized the workshop, is one of the world's premier energy scenario think tanks. Ask any oil and gas strategist to identify the best sources of high-quality data and analysis on the energy world, and the IEA is right up there, alongside the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, which is a U.S. government outfit, and BP, which is a largish petroleum company with an outstanding economics group. The International Energy Agency, therefore, has oodles of credibility. It's in select company. The IEA was put in place in 1974 at the time of the OPEC oil crisis. At that moment, governments discovered that they didn't have enough information about oil movements, including production, inventories, movements, and pricing, to be able to set competent policies to cope with the shortages in the system. Today, the IEA has 29 member countries and 80-plus associate countries who supply Um, uh, provide supply and demand information to the agency, participate in its research projects, and contribute various capabilities to the agency. Its remit is now much broader, taking into account demand management, electricity markets, cross-border connectivity, oil and gas, coal, clean energy, carbon, batteries, energy efficiency, and now digital. The IEA counts many governments amongst its customers and is therefore very influential in the realm of policymaking at national and local levels. So one of the early questions was, why digitalization and why now? The IEA has published research and developed scenarios on the topic of digital in the past, so it is no surprise that its research continues on the impacts of digital developments on energy in the years ahead. Still, the impacts are not well defined, not well measured, and not well resolved, to quote a speaker at the World Economic Forum. But at the workshop, the first of its kind, the repeated mention of just a few trigger events underscored the agency's motivation to reflect with renewed enthusiasm or concern on the role of digital in energy in the future. The first was the rise of Uber, that upstart on-demand personal transport service and its band of brothers like Lyft. Uber illustrates with stark clarity the speed by which ancient business models, such as Carriage for Hire, which dates back to 1605, can be dramatically overturned by bringing readily available digital technologies, that is, smartphones, cloud computing, wireless networks, card payment, and social trust systems, to tired business models. Striking taxi drivers, street violence against Uberistas, the challenges to Uber's hiring practices, and Uber's tortured avoidance of regulatory entanglements have forced policymakers to intervene with bans or new regulations in what was a stable, if poor quality, market service, that is, taxis in big cities. In the same way that the oil price shocks of the 1970s startled governments, the rise of digital disruptions in the energy sector could wreak similar havoc in local energy markets. Much as Uber has junked taxis, Airbnb has occupied hotels, or Amazon Amazon has rung up retail. The question was, how many Uber-like developments are out there? The second concern has been the alarming rise in the number of cyber attacks on energy infrastructure by dark forces, or perhaps state actors, a freshly laundered term for people with sinister intent, with particular reference to Ukraine. In December of 2015, those dark forces penetrated the power grid in Ukraine, shut down power substations, and cut off power to a quarter million residents in the middle of winter. North Americans, well, me anyway, generally have limited practical experience with the direct consequences of cyber attacks on public infrastructure. Sure, I get the occasional request from my friends warning about their mishaps with viruses. But vulnerabilities in the energy infrastructure have certainly scared the bejesus out of the European power industry. And without planning, digital advancements threaten to open up a whole new digital war front. The third trigger has been carbon management. There has been worryingly slow progress on dealing with carbon, and the hopeful possibility that digital developments might actually help accelerate compliance with the Paris Accord's two-degree scenario. For example, digital inventions like OpenEE, this is an outfit out of California, are helping to unlock creative low-carbon solutions in some advanced markets, notably the U.S., 
But without some positive guidance, however, policymakers could be lured into blocking the promising answers or promoting poor choices or generally slowing down the transition to newer energy models enabled by digital. Let me just turn to the workshop. Well, I can't reveal who exactly was there, <clears throat> but the invites included a name dropper's ultimate list of the global energy world, including big utilities, large oil and gas producers, leading technology companies, preeminent regulators, thoughtful governments, some defense agencies, and some disruptive newcomers, and me. The IEA structured its workshop as a set of panel discussions, with typically four panelists who had only five minutes each for their remarks, followed by a large group facilitated discussion. And by large group, think 80 plus people. The workshop set out to probe a number of perplexing questions which would eventually lead to an IEA publication for release later this year. Number one, how big will the impact of digital on energy be, and how quickly will it manifest? Number two, which companies are best positioned to survive and thrive in the turmoil? Number three, what are the most significant barriers that must be overcome? And four, what should government energy ministries be aware of and more importantly do about digital? Well, this podcast is going to just dig into that very first question. I'll address the balance in a subsequent podcast. Short fuse, big bang. I quite like this turn of phrase, short fuse, big bang. The fuse refers to how long it will take for the impact of digital to be felt, and big is the size of the impact. It's also the title of a Deloitte publication from Australia that looked at exactly this question on the Australian economy. Among the digerati, there's a certain breathlessness and hype about the impact of digital, and the assertion that it's already here in the form of smartphones, drones, Uber, etc., but the fact is that of the world's installed energy production and distribution capacity, that is power plants, pipes, wires, oil facilities, and refineries, the vast majority, certainly 80 to 90%, was built long before digital even became a thing. They are ill-equipped to participate in a digital world without some kind of hardcore retrofit, which is tricky to pull off since these plants now run 24-7. An apt analogy would be like installing a pacemaker on a marathon runner in the middle of a race, with the runner having to carry the doctors, nurses, and in fact the entire operating room at the same time. The fuse, therefore, is going to sputter along for years as companies retire plants, build new ones, and undertake digital renovations during the occasional turnaround, and only if the economics make short-term sense, which they rarely do. The bang is ultimately going to be big in the aggregate, but will probably be more like a series of small aftershocks from an earthquake, minus the big one. We won't even feel many of them. Only in a few years' time, and with hindsight, will analysts be able to identify the key tipping points in the drive to digitalize. A clear takeaway from the session, though, was that energy systems had very significant potential to benefit from increased digitalization. For example, one presenter shared the following key points, just about oil and gas. Digital will help unlock some 450 billion barrels of oil otherwise inaccessible through better seismic interpretation. So if you do the math, that's 22.5 trillion at today's oil prices. Oil companies use at best only 20% of their data. Well, frankly, one of Canada's leading oil and gas companies put the figure at a measly 0.5%. Some trials show that data scientists can be as good as geologists at finding oil by applying big data techniques honed in other fields. And finally, autonomous vehicles could improve overall fuel efficiency by 30% or more. That would equate to two to three years of global industry growth at today's paces. Well, what about other industry sectors? While it wasn't the principal aim of the workshop to get into how digital might unlock other industries, the point was not lost that many sectors of the economy are going to be digitally impacted. Those impacts are hard to forecast. The reduction of energy inputs or carbon emissions is a key driver for digital change and that policymakers cannot easily isolate these sectors from each other through policy choices. Here's just a few of the industries poised for transformation by the same forces impacting energy and the likely impacts on energy consumption. Number one is smart logistics. Here, fuel will be reduced by optimizing delivery systems. Smart manufacturing. Fuel will be reduced by making to order on site through 3D printing. Smart homes. Fuel will be reduced by changing consumer behavior with data. Smart education. Fuel is, will be reduced by not attending school in person, but online. 
and smart retail. Fuel will be reduced not by shopping in person, but by shopping online. The bottom line is that the workshop participants were uniform in their views. Digital is going to be big. It's going to be everywhere at the same time. It's going to take a while to play out, and it's going to help a carbon-constrained world. Check out my next podcast as I dig into the remaining three questions. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.